The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Morning Markets Kickoff with your host, Tommy O'Brien. Now, Tommy O'Brien. Good morning, everybody. I'm Tommy O'Brien, coming to you live from TFNN just after 9 a.m. Eastern time. We got a CPI report, cooling inflation, going to be the theme at least until we get a Fed decision at 2 p.m. Eastern time today. Going to be an interesting day. Always interesting when we have a Fed decision at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We got some pretty important economic data on the inflation front at 8.30. That data showing inflation cooling a bit more than expected uh, as a precursor to the Fed decision this afternoon. We'll see what Chairman Powell has to say, but nonetheless, the market liking lower inflation numbers, and you see the pop. We just popped about 40 points in the S&P. You're gonna open in record territory, 54.31. We're up by about nine tenths percent. NASDAQ 100, we're up by almost a full percent right now. We're almost going to get 20,000 on the futures. How about it, man? We're up 178 points, 14,420. The Dow up 343 points, 39,137. And how about the Russell? Russell up by 3.1%. Did you get that one, folks? 3.1%. The Russell just popped from 2030 to 2090. You're up by 62 points. Now, this is putting, of course, lower yields, weaker dollar, Adding to commodities and everything's up. We got Bitcoin up by 2300 bucks, right at 73, uh, excuse me, right at 2300 on the dot. Now, as I mentioned, you got a weaker dollar. That's going to put a slight bid into crude, into gold, priced in dollars. You got crude up by a dollar 18. It was already higher in the pre market. 79.09. Gold catching a bid up by $30 to 23.56. We jump over to that 10 year. Now, what's interesting here is before everyone pops the champagne bottles and celebrates, all we've done is retrace to the move we had on Friday. It's Wednesday. We just got the jobs number that was hot, hot, hot on Friday. And all of a sudden, we got a new theme in the market on a slight miss in inflation. Now, can inflation numbers cool while this market remains hot? Yes, it can happen. But just keep things in perspective, folks, okay? Pretty remarkable that all you've done is reclaim Friday's move. You're back to 110.11, right where we came into that jobs number on Friday, which was hot. We're up by 25 basis points right now on the 10-year, okay? And that is putting our 10-year yield right now at about 4.3%, down about 10 basis points from where we were coming into that move but we got quite a move yesterday as well we were approaching i think yesterday's program we kicked things off at about 4.45 percent 15 basis points in 24 hours just mammoth moves illustrates the uncertainty in this economy when it comes to yields when it comes to the fed and the possibility of cuts that are looming down the line especially on a longer term basis i mean that is a mammoth move on a 10-year folks when you're talking about going yesterday at one o'clock in the afternoon we almost had a 108 handle and we are right now at 110.11, as I mentioned, right back to where we were on Friday. So what do you have? You have higher price and lower yield. We're at 4.3% on the 10-year. And that, of course, going to weaken the dollar. 104.43 on the dollar. We started the session off at 105. We've given up a full point in the dollar from where we were yesterday. Just mammoth moves across the board. You jump over to the VIX. No volatility premium on a market that just goes straight up. VIX at 12.24 on the volatility index. Uh, Going to be an interesting day, folks. That is to say the least. Now, what I have been talking about, let's look at these numbers to kick things off first. So here are the fundamentals of what we just got here. You got the numbers. CPI, month over month, flat. The Fed prefers, prefers the core. Core CPI, month over month, up 0.2%. CPI on a year-over-year -year basis, 3.3%. On a core basis, 3.4%. All of those numbers you can see slightly below the estimates by one-tenth percent, right? Estimates on the right here, actual on the left. And as you can see, each number, one-tenth percent below. So you're talking about one-tenth percent. Okay, this is not some mammoth number that it's being portrayed as in the market right now. Yes, it's a lower number than what the market was thinking across the board. But be careful is all I'll say. And I imagine Chairman Powell is going to be very tempered with his words. They're looking for a trend. 
and this is going to be one month of data. They're still going to be looking for a trend. So as I just laid it out, right? Consumer prices, 3.3 versus 3.4. On a core level, 3.4 versus 3.5 was the estimate. This is just going over some of the numbers here from Bloomberg. Inflation is ticking down. Core comes in a touch lower than expected. You wouldn't think that's the headline from how the markets are reacting. The core gain of 0.2%, only forecast about 12 out of 71 economists. So it's a lower number, not really what people were thinking here. They are bolstering the narrative that we do get potentially a cut coming down the line in potentially September. Okay, Treasury yields plunge. The two-year drops 12 basis points. I just talked about the 10-year sitting at 4.3%. We're as high as almost 4.45 just as of yesterday. One of the comments here, first month of good inflation reports. Folks, it is June of 2024. How long have we been talking about that maybe inflation is easing? And we're getting things like this is the first month of good inflation reports. We still have a ways to go. I'm going to try and bring some sanity into these reports. Uh, and I imagine Chairman Powell is going to bring some sanity into the market rejoicing and trading to all-time highs across the board with the type of reversal in yields that we have going on, especially on a longer-term basis. We may get one cut. We may get two. As I was talking to Jacob yesterday, where do we go next year? Right? Do we really get cuts in the lower end of the four range for their target range? I don't think so, man. I don't think that's going to be the case. Nonetheless, Fed swaps fully price in a quarter point cut by November. It's not out of the woods, folks, that we get one cut, maybe two. Okay, I would imagine that the conversation is quickly going to shift from maybe we get one to two cuts. That's not going to be a deal breaker, one to two cuts this year. The deal breaker is going to be where do we go next year? Does the Fed sit in a range that is higher for longer for an extended period of time. I think that's the conversation that we're going to be having right now. So two-year yields, <clears throat> 12 basis points, we're sitting at 4.7. You got S&P futures spiking higher, up almost 8 tenths percent. NASDAQ up almost a full percent. Auto insurance falling on the month, but check it out, up more than 20 percent, higher than a year ago. And yeah, I'm dealing with some higher auto insurance in Florida, man, let me tell you. That is for sure. Yeah, this is just uh, some of the different anecdotal evidence of what's going on here. How do we just get down there? We just scroll down for some reason. All right, we'll cherry pick some of this data. Yeah, new vehicles dropped 0.5% after a 0.4% decline in April. So you got bo boosting demand, bolstering demand for cars. Okay, airfares for the month of May down 3.6% after falling 0.8% in April. We'll have to see if that trend continues over the bumper summer travel season. But you have declining prices in airfares, in new vehicles. One of the things helping this print out is gas prices that are down for sure. They get into that at some point in this. Yeah, markets hold on to it relatively well, man. Yeah, and I'd hang on to this point right here. The key point here is that the Fed has made clear that it needs to see several cooler readings to move toward a first rate cut. Now, where's your risk reward in this market as a trader? The risk reward is the market's pricing and cuts are coming. Well, if the market's pricing in, the cuts are already priced in and the data isn't there yet, where's the risk? The data is the risk. The data is that it doesn't line up like it has this time. We'll see, man. But the, the, the market is rejoicing like we've made it and we haven't made it just yet. Good number. You like to see it, but we'll see where we go from there, folks. Stay tuned. We're coming back. We got the markets in positive territory. We'll be talking to our man Teddy Kegstat later, later in the hour. I'll be right back, folks. Stay tuned. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. In the world of trading, only a few names stand out like Larry Pesavento. A pro's pro with over 50 years of experience, Larry has seen it all. A former Chicago Mercantile Exchange member, Larry has authored 10 books and trained over 1,000 traders with his unmatched expertise. Introducing Fibonacci 24-7, Larry Pesavento's daily trading service that turns the complexity of markets into opportunities. Published every Sunday, receive a comprehensive report packed with detailed commentary, charts, 
charts, and videos that illuminate the patterns shaping the markets with updates throughout the week exclusively for subscribers. Whether through charts or videos, Larry's analysis is your roadmap to navigating the markets. You can sign up now at TFNN.com for just $97. And with all TFNN newsletters backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee, you have nothing to risk. For all the details, visit TFNN.com. You'll find Fibonacci 24-7 right under the newsletters tab. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters Letters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 Days Risk-Free today. TFNN, educating investors. This portion of the Morning Market Kickoff is brought to you by Direction's Daily Leveraged and Inverse ETFs. Whether you're a bull or a bear, you choose the direction. Visit Direction.com. Investing in the funds involves significant risk and should only be utilized by investors who understand the impact of leverage and actively monitor their portfolio. They are not designed to track the underlying index or security for more than a day. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at Direction.com. Read carefully. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. Welcome back, folks. It's going to be an interesting day in the markets. We got a cool CPI number. We'll see how that reacts on the open in about 11 minutes from right now. But markets rejoicing, yields pulling back, dollar weakening. You have commodities to the upside, gold up $29, holding on to those gains right now. Now, interesting, man. Though you look where gold was on Friday, right? Gold hit 2406, we're 2355. You get a little bit of a pop. You take a look at where we were on the dollar on friday not quite back to the lows but almost we we're sitting at 104 we're at 104.41 after trading all the way up to 105.45 for the dollar and the reason why i mentioned those is because you take a look at the s p where we were on friday we're at 53.60 you're at 54.30 but then you look at yields and it's a complete reversal we're just back to where we were on friday that's all it is 10-year yield sitting at about 4.3 percent you made it as all the way down to a price of 109. That correlated to a yield of about 4.45, almost approaching 4.5% on the 10-year. You recoil to where we were, right coming into that hot jobs number on Friday, and yield sitting at 4.3% as the market pricing in. Almost two cuts this year, and we'll see where we go from there. Some of the other data from that inflation CPI print at 8.30. As I mentioned, gas prices. So gas prices, one of the key reasons down two point, excuse me, down 3.6 in May from April. That's a month figure, folks. Down 3.6% in May from April. One key reason why the headline CPI actually flat. Now, the core month over month comes in up 0.2%. The headline is flat. And that's the reason why the Fed doesn't really care about the headline, because they can't influence something like crude. And it is remarkable that at a time when everybody's talking about inflation, we're paying almost $3 at the pump right now for crude. And yeah, that's probably going to go up as we got crude, I think, at about $79 this morning. Now you look at housing, okay? Now this is why the Fed prefers the PPI producer, excuse me, not the producer, uh, the P 
PCE. And that is because that's the personal con consumption expenditure. Okay, the reason why they prefer that is because it's a greater reflection of all of the goods that we consume versus the ones that we actually just pay for. And that's because certain aspects of the CPI are a huge component and some are not. Housing. Shelter index rose 5.4% over the last year, making up over two-thirds of the total 12-month increase in the all items, less food and energy index. So CPI really gets skewed by housing because it's one of the biggest components that you actually pay out of pocket when you think about it, compared to something like the PCE, where healthcare costs are a bigger component in the PCE, and that's because what happens? Well, a lot of people, you consume healthcare even though you don't actually pay for it because it's paid for by your job. And that's one of the quickest illustrations of the difference between consumer price index, something we pay for as consumers, versus something like healthcare, which is a product we consume but don't actually pay for because it's included in our employment and that's paid for by your jobs and the companies. Nonetheless, it is a product you consume and it factors into what's going on. So you got a bunch of, not a bunch, but you have Fed speak out there. You have Bullard out on Bloomberg saying he said, uh, we are now seeing immaculate disinflation. Well, I'd be careful on that one, folks, okay? Um, this is the first time, this is the quote I want to get to, which is great, for a little bit of context here. This is the first time, reminder, it's, it's June, okay, since October report that the core monthly CPI gain has undershot the median forecast. Think about that. One illustration of how inflation has been disappointing you could say disappointingly hot for much of the past half year. And you're telling me this is going to be the report that somehow is the Goldilocks everything? It's the first time that you have the core monthly CPI gain undershooting the median forecast. And it does it by 0.1%, folks. Okay. Energy fell 2% in May after rising 1.1% in April. A big part of that, as I mentioned, 3.6% for gasoline on a month over month basis down in May versus April there. Yeah, and you talk about cars. Um, is it a good time to trade up? Well, year over year, I'm not sure. Month over month, maybe. Used cars and trucks rose 06 in May. They're still down 9.3% from a year ago. This is where, you know, Year over year, the numbers are still bonkers, for lack of a better term, man. Uh, I mean, what do we just say here? You have used prices down, uh, excuse me, rising, but they're down almost 10% year over year. Just mammoth numbers on a year over year basis. Yeah, you look at shelter costs. Okay, we talked about those. Core CPI excluding shelter up just 1.9% from a year earlier. Well, that's great, but shelter's a big component, okay? People are paying rent prices that are through the roof right now. So, you know, owner equivalent rent, that's a much better argument to get into, whether that even belongs in CPI for sure. Uh, they talk about the political aspect of things, of course, but they talk about things when you look at a year-over-year -year basis. Yeah. And they're talking about Powell. That's going to be the quickest segue, man. One comment here. Likely to be very straight. When he remarks on these numbers, they obviously point to progress, but he's going to be very careful not to stoke bets on a near-term rate cut. He had already had to walk back the December pivot. He won't want to get burned twice. Twice. I mean, how many times? Has he really only been burned twice? I would argue they've been ahead of themselves many times as he has had to do a little bit of a reversal here. The bond reaction? Yeah, it's a big one, man. On course for the biggest two-year yield drop this year so far. We're more than 10 basis points. You back it up. We had one in early January that you really had to pull back. Um, it's going to be a mammoth move in yields for sure. We'll see if they hold. Super core numbers easing for sure. I think it was the first time that you've had super core actually decrease is one of the numbers they're talking about out there. Food prices 2.1% higher from a year ago. Not a lot of people talking about that though. Doesn't really feel like it, right? And that's going to matter when you talk about the impact on the economy that it can have. Yeah, September rate put, cut now back in play. 75% chance of a cut up from roughly odds, even odds before the data. And they're talking about September. Yeah, and I wouldn't get too concerned with a market gauge of one cut to two cut this year. 
If you're really trying to make a play here on the economy, on your portfolio, on equities, you know, you go out a little bit longer, you might get yourself in trouble, okay? But we're looking at an S&P right now trading at 5430. We're looking at a 10-year yield of 4.3%. And again, this is the first time that you've had core inflation undershoot the estimate since October. Not exactly surprising inflation to the downside, folks. Not exactly at all. We're right back to where we were just as of Friday. And you put this on a weekly basis. And look at the low price. We're right back to where we were in October of 2022. And we've just been chopping at those lower levels. Absolutely remarkable. All right. We're coming back for the open, folks, where supply equals demand. Stay tuned. We'll come back. Uh, s and is going to open at record territory. We'll take a look at some of the other equities moving this morning. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The consistency you're looking for is closer than you think. One or two adjustments are usually all you need to change your equity curve from red to green and keep it there. Come join Larry Pesavento Live to learn what separates the winners from the losers. Join Larry Pesavento on the second and fourth Friday of every month for three hours of live trading from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Time, where Larry will show you the market setting up and most important of all, the state of mind of a winning trader. By watching Larry trade, you'll learn the Fibonacci levels. You'll learn how to apply A to B to C to D trading patterns. You'll learn trade management, pattern recognition, and much more. Join Larry Pesavento on Friday, June 14th and Friday, June 28th this month for his live trading sessions, where you'll sit right beside him as he trades the market live. For this month only, enter code LARRYJUNE24 and save $50 off your first month. For all the information and to reserve your spot today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. If you spend any time online researching trading techniques on how to begin your trading journey, you've no doubt come across many folks who push Forex trading as a way to make big money quickly. Unfortunately, there are equally as many stories of these so-called Forex professionals just looking to make a quick buck off aspiring traders without actually teaching the ins and outs of the Forex market. This is what sets Teddy Kekstack's The Tiger Forex Report off the riffraff. Every Monday, former Chicago Mercantile Exchange member and author Teddy Kekstad releases his Tiger Forex Report newsletter, where he dives into the complex world of Forex and takes time to actually teach you his methods that have made him so successful in the fast-paced and rewarding world of Forex trading. Furthermore, all subscribers receive access to archived live streams of Teddy's, where he provides university-level education to help you in Forex trading. All first-time subscribers receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Forex awaits. The stock market is a delicate, interconnecting web of commodities, equities, and trader psychology. When one string of the web is pulled, it has a ripple effect across the broader market. This is where opportunity lies. But how are you to gather all of this information into one cohesive model when you're already spending your energy looking for any possible trade opportunities? Luckily, you don't have to worry about that, as Tom O'Brien has brought all important market news to you in one single newsletter, Market Insights. Market Insights provides a daily overview of what's happening in the indexes, bonds, gold, and more. Follow along with Tom daily as he analyzes the components that affect the overall movement of the stock market, giving insight into how each one plays either a bullish or bearish role. Tom also analyzes specific equities that he believes has the potential to make huge returns, and his track record proves his analysis right. All first-time subscribers receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Don't let the market leave you in the dust. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. We got markets open. You got an S&P right now up by 45 points. That's a record print, folks. 54.28 in the S&Ps. You talk about an acceleration. We'll see if we hold. Now, look at the NASDAQ. <clears throat> NASDAQ, you're up by seven tenths. 
A little bit of a re reversal, though. We were all the way up to 19,458. You give up 70 points from that high. We're still higher, but only by about 135. The Russell man up by 2.6%. You talk about an acceleration. Bitcoin near about 70,000. We take a look at commodities. Crude continuing to climb 79.24. We talk to our man Teddy Kegstat. Next segment, always interesting. We'll talk some Forex. Great day to talk to Teddy as we get some moving yields. We got some moving the currencies. Dollar weakening on a little bit of a pullback in yields. We'll see what Teddy's got to say coming up at 40 past the hour as we do every Wednesday. You got gold pushing higher right now, up by $28 to $23.54 in the price of crude. And we check in on yields. Just hanging right where we were on the high, man. We got the 10-year right now. Where are we sitting in that 10-year? 4.29, 4.29% as we hear from Chairman Powell at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. You get some dot plot updates today as well at 2 p.m. on the announcement. I imagine you're going to hear a bunch of the same as usual, right? This is one data point. And it is interesting that, yes, he's going to get asked about the CPI. He's also going to get asked about the jobs number on Friday. Don't forget about that one. We got, I mean, the human mind, the recency bias, the way it impacts us from just a hum, human perspective. What happened to the conversation on Friday? Right. We had 272,000 jobs added, more jobs than anyone imagined. Wages continue to run hot. And then we come into a CPI that's soft and they're conflicting data points. The Fed wants to see a real trend here. They're going to look for the next couple data points. Now we get PCE, the one I was just talking about, I think June 28th. I was just looking at one article that referenced it. Uh, June 28th, I believe, we get the PCE. So that's an interesting one. Now, we get PPI tomorrow. Not as important, but another inflation data point on the producer side. We'll see where we go from there. And let's tie into yields. Mortgage. So a brief drop in mortgage rates caused a huge – now, that is um, an interesting choice of words because, like I always say, folks, remember this phrase. Percentages on small numbers can be deceiving, okay? If you go from a 1 to a 2 – that's a 100% increase, but you're still at a two from a one, right? Which is still a very low number, depending on what context that's in. So what they're talking about here is total mortgage application volume surged at CNBC. They're looking for clickbait. Nearly 16% compared with the previous week. Well, what was the previous week? It was probably nothing. I'm exaggerating, but you get the point. The average contract interest rate decreased to 7.02 from 7.07. That's not going to do it, folks, okay? That type of a move is not going to do it. Applications to refinance a home jumped 28% last week compared with the previous week. Now, I read this, and here's what I'll give you what I thought initially. You know what I thought? I said, maybe people are struggling, man. Maybe people have finally reached the point that they said, you know what? I can't hold out anymore. I've hit my limit on credit card funds. I've hit my limit on what I want to be spending from my savings. I've hit my limit, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to refinance my home to access the equity within that home, and I'm going to pay the 7% and hope that interest rates decline and I can refinance in the future because I can't hold out anymore and I want to access the equity in that home because these numbers are not because of this. They're not because mortgage rates just went to 7.02 from 7.07. .07. So if they're not because of mortgage rates – then why are people refinancing at a much higher level than previous? Maybe they've tapped out. All right. I don't know, but that's what I found myself thinking, because that is not going to be the determining factor going from 7.07 .07 to 7.02. Now, we might see a decline this week with the 10 year dropping to 4.3 yet again. We'll see if they go from there. But be careful reading articles like this and thinking that somehow everyone's back because mortgage rates are above 7%. Because that's not where I get things at all. Buyer beware across the board. All right. Perfect segue to buyer beware. Tesla shares. Yeah, look at this thing, man. Tesla down today. Down. Look at this market and Tesla is negative. Be careful for Tesla shares, folks. And I am not an Elon hater, man. You know, he has revolutionized the world. He is a character like none other. He's brought electric vehicles to the forefront when nobody would. He did it himself. Okay. So I'm not a hater. Um, you know, space in terms of privatizing space, tourism, travel, um, privatizing what NASA is doing in terms of private contracts or businesses. There's no reason why other companies couldn't have done this that had the capital that Elon had times probably 10. 
But there's some funky stuff, for lack of a better term, man, going on at Tesla. Now, the pay package is out there. Right, you had him out there yesterday decrying open AI, teaming up with Apple, etc. They're back in the positive right now. But boy, it seems like every single day, folks, you wake up and you got something else going on. And this one is from the journal. Right on the front page, it almost beats the headline of the CPI. Okay. Elon Musk's boundary blurring relationships with women at SpaceX. Now this has come out before, okay? And the Wall Street Journal is not some liberal rag piece, folks, okay? He catches a lot of heat from the left as he's shifted to the right, or you could say the parties have both shifted to the left and to the right, etc. But some of the quotes in this, I mean, it just keeps coming out, and every time these stories come out, folks, and this is a long one. If you get a chance, check it out. I can't go through it all. It is a long, big, exclusive piece. They talked with dozens and dozens of people um, from his companies, SpaceX in particular, okay, private company, SpaceX, and every time I read one of these, I say to myself, if this was any other Fortune 500 CEO, they would probably be out of their position within 24 hours. You add on to that, you know, the NVIDIA chips that he's siphoning off to SpaceX, and it's just a very blurry picture, for lack of a better term, and I'm using tame verbiage out there but be careful on tesla man because it seems like every single day you wake up and there's another tantalizing story that does not reflect well uh where is the board oversight on tesla now spacex private company they still have a board but a private company when you're a public company it's remarkable and that's where the pay package goes out i just don't understand what's going on yes this company can go higher okay but i look at things from a risk reward perspective kevin hinks always says and we'll get him back on the air kevin for sure um but he has a great quote at, at at one, you know, when you look at any equity, at a certain price, I'd be a buyer. At a certain price, I'd be a seller. Any equity can be oversold or overbought, depending on how good it is, how bad it is. Regardless, any equity, no matter how great of a company or how poor of a company it is, can be overbought or oversold. And from a risk reward perspective right now, the data that can come out with Tesla, I see the risk skewed dramatically to the downside versus to the upside when you think about the troubles that they have. Now, Elon's put out that the self-driving fleet is coming in August, and if you believe that, then God bless you. Maybe you got some action to the upside, but that's a story, and I don't think the story is, is concrete enough to hold up Tesla anymore. This market, though, look at, look at that NASDAQ. Right back to the highs, man. So much for a pullback. You get a pop. You're back to 19,441. Remarkable. Now, NVIDIA shares. Check this one out on NVIDIA. I put this one out on my newsletter on Monday. Something to keep your eye on for NVIDIA shares. Take out that spike. It's not real. NVIDIA just completed an A to B, C to D from where we were at the beginning of the year. So be careful. Maybe you just chop around for a bit. We did not go short. Okay. NVIDIA shares. But interesting that you did just complete an A to B, C to D. Stay tuned, folks. We're coming back with Teddy Kegstad. We'll talk some Forex. We'll talk some Are you ready to take charge of your financial future? TFNN is your gateway to the world of trading and investing. Whether you're starting out or scaling up, TFNN empowers traders and investors of all skill levels with top-notch investing systems, strategies, and techniques. It's time to protect and grow your money with insight you can trust. Join us live Monday through Friday during market hours for exclusive content that moves with the markets. At TFNN, we bring the trading floor to you. Our seasoned hosts are here to answer your calls and questions live on the air. Check out the Tiger's Den for just $1 and follow us on YouTube and become part of our vibrant community. And remember, at TFNN, we're so confident in the value we provide that we offer a 30-day money-back guarantee on all new premium newsletter subscriptions and services. You have absolutely nothing to risk, so why wait? Tune in live to Tiger TV and transform your trading journey. Because when you know better, you invest better. Join us and experience the difference today. TFNN, educating investors. Many trading newsletters attempt to focus on a narrow set of equities or commodities. While this works for some, it oftentimes misses many opportunities that possess huge gain potential. But how is an independent trader supposed to scan the entire market looking for these hidden opportunities? One simple answer, the opening call newsletter. Basil Chapman, developer of the Chapman Wave trading methodology, has been trading the markets for longer than most trading influencers have been alive. 
And over that time, he has honed his methodology in order to accurately call movements in a wide range of equities, from semiconductors to uranium to key indices and so much more. Basil is old school, taking the time to educate the trader while also giving his insights into key indices, selective stocks, and more. Opening Call subscribers also receive access to dozens of educational live streams that can be accessed at any time for your edification. All first-time subscribers receive a 30-day money-back guarantee. So ignore the pop trading influencers and start learning time-tested technical analysis. For traders who crave risk, Direction's daily leveraged and inverse ETFs provide opportunities to magnify short-term perspectives with up to three times a daily leverage, utilize bull and bear funds from both sides of the trade, and trade through rapidly changing markets. These are highly leveraged ETFs with daily resetting designed for short-term trading, not long-term investing. Whether you're a bull or a bear, you choose the Direction. For up-to-date pricing and performance, go to Direction. Dot com. Investing in the funds involves significant risk and should only be utilized by investors who understand the impact of leverage and actively monitor their portfolio. They are not designed to track the underlying index or security for more than a day. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at Direction.com. Read carefully. Distributor Foresight Fund Services, LLC. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. Welcome back, folks, and we got markets continuing to climb. Liking this number, man. How about the S&Ps now up 51 points, trading up to 54.35. I re recalibrate every number in my head, man. NASDAQ 100 up by 1.1%. 1 the Dow, 39,109. We're up by 324 points right now. We jump around to some of the equities in focus. How about GameStop? Uh, they were ready. They were ready for the next meme phase. And how <laughs> the meme phase. And how about this? They raised more than $2 billion by selling 75 million shares, capitalizing on that meme frenzy. You could say the last time this stuff happened, right? That the stock's just not quick enough to capitalize when you had some of these stratospheric runs in their equities. Well, yeah, they were ready. They announced that uh, they completed an at-the-market equity offering, selling the maximum number of 75 million shares, and they raised $2.14 billion. Dollars and what is that? What do they get for that price? 2.14 divided by 75 million. 28 bucks. They got 28 bucks a share. Look at that. Is that right? That's right. They got 28 bucks a share. Man, they got some great traders in there getting 28 bucks a share because look at where this equity has been. Yeah, they got $28.53 a share. They sold 75 million shares into the market and got $28.53 a share. I hope the traders on the GME desk are getting some bonuses because that is a heck of a trade, man. $28.53. They get $2 billion in straight cash on the meme frenzy. And, uh, yeah, can't beat that, man. Some other equities in focus. We look over to Paramount. That deal with Skydance falling through. Surprising. Hits the market yesterday. You drop out of the woods from 1220. Look at that, man. Down to 1080. You're up a bit today from the pre-market, but still negative on the session. Jump around. Excuse me. Where are we here? Just give me one second, folks. There we go. Okay. They're trying to get our man Teddy on there. Hopefully we'll get him on. Uh, but this market, it's not stopping, man. We'll jump over to the dollar. You got the dollar index down to 104.39. And let's take a look at crude. So some interesting stuff. Take a look at this crude market, 7907. But if you haven't seen the stories, folks, absolutely remarkable when you talk about big oil. So the IEA, the International Energy 
agency, okay, they came out with a report, and boy, if this one plays out, what is going to happen to crude over the next six years? My goodness. Now, the one thing I always say is crude right now is three bucks a gallon. That's gas. Excuse me, not crude. Okay, gas, processed. You go buy a gallon of water and it's like a buck sixty nine, a buck ninety nine, depending on what you're buying. Okay, so when oil gets to where it's cheaper than a gallon of water, and listen, we need water, but we need oil too. That's where things just don't play out in my head, okay? But with that said, they talk about that by the year two thousand thirty, folks, that's like tomorrow in terms of the market sometimes, okay? That we are gonna hit a peak demand. Yeah. We're gonna hit a peak because of the way that probably renewable energies, EVs, etc. Okay. Oil demand growth was on track to slow down before reaching its peak near 106 million barrels a day by 2030. That's one aspect. My goodness. Oil demand is going to stop growing by 2030. Okay. Take that one in. And then you have oil production is surging to nearly 114 million barrels a day by 2030. So at the same time, you have oil demand decreasing. You have production continuing to pick up. We're going to have 8 million barrels a day of surplus in six years. That is going to create a dynamic that could have, quote unquote, significant consequences. You could have a surplus that is unprecedented, going back to really some of the lockdowns we saw during COVID. Okay. And yeah, you're going to see production outstrip demand growth between now and the end of the decade, pushing spare capacity to unprecedented levels um, and potentially upending OPEC Plus's market management. What happens? I don't know what happens, but that is a, a whole new frontier. And maybe that's one of the things that's looming out there that, you know, continues to put some pressure to the downside on the price of crude. I was talking with Jacob yesterday saying, hey, you know, he asked a great question. What do you think, man, of this price? We got some remarkable low prices. We're in summer driving season. So you got to follow the price action. Okay, crude continues to struggle to find a bid, even in the face of multiple. What do we got? We got Russia invading Ukraine. We have the war in the Middle East, right, with Israel and Palestine. We have heads of state in the Middle East dying that could provide just any type of uncertainty over there. And nonetheless, crude cannot find a bid. And we continue to have increased production from the U.S. Thankfully, we now are a huge producer. We don't have to rely on the Middle East like we used to. And this is the global energy watchdog saying, hey, guess what? Production is going to outstrip demand and we are going to hit. I mean, think about this. We are going to hit a point in our lifetimes where peak oil demand is reached in the next five or six years and then it goes down why does it go down because other renewable energy sources sources begin to get used that in itself is a dynamic that i don't think the market may be ready for and then you think that we have production going up over that time um yeah we might be paying less at the pump as we go forward man and five to six years folks i'll just put it this way covid was four and a half years ago when it hit in four and a half years from right now, we're almost reaching max oil demand during our lifetime. That is a head scratcher, man, when you read this one. Yeah. So despite the projected slowdown in oil demand growth, IEA noted that the in the absence of stronger policy measures, crude demand is still expected to be around 3.2 million barrels a day higher by 2030 than today. So you're going to see an increase, okay? But that's why we reach our peak. But production is outstripping it, period. OK, oil demand is on course to dip below 43 million barrels a day by 2030, down from close to 46 million barrels a day last year. It's crazy. Aside from the coronavirus pandemic, the last time oil demand from advanced economies was that low was in 1991. So there's some head scratches there across the board. Keep that one in mind on a longer term basis as you see crude continuing to struggle. Now, back to that NVIDIA chart real quick. So, listen, I said in my newsletter Monday, I'm not going short on NVIDIA shares, man, because how do you do it, okay? How do you do that? You just don't. I, I don't I don't think I could do that one. But it is interesting. Uh, that, that little uptick is skewing this chart to make it a little bit tough. But take a look at it, man. And I didn't cherry pick some bottom. That is the bottom of the run that began, okay, in January. I mean, you had NVIDIA at 48. We were at 50 bucks all the way in August of 23. So the run really begins in January of 2024. 
you trade from these are exact pennies folks 47.32 is the a 97.40 is the b that's 50 dollars c point 7561 that brings it up to 125.69 and we get 125.59 it is c to d you got a back of the three eight we'll take a look at that when we come back folks stay tuned we'll be right back The Gold Report. As a precious metal, gold is still king. It continues to hold the most effective safe haven and hedging properties across the global major trading hubs of the London OTC market, the U.S. futures market, and the Shanghai Gold Exchange. The Gold Report. Tom O'Brien publishes his weekly gold report every Monday morning for subscribers, consisting of coverage of the XAU, HUI, GDX, the dollar, bonds, the South African Rand, as well as 25 different mining equities with specific buy-sell recommendations. The Gold Report. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. Subscribe to Tom O'Brien's Gold Report newsletter now at TFNN.com. Steve Rhodes started his trading career as a student almost 20 years ago, and the student has now become the master. Steve won the prestigious Timer of the Year Award in 2018 and barely missed that mark again in 2019, finishing at number two for the year. An amazing accomplishment. Steve Rhodes is committed to sharing his techniques and knowledge with anyone who wants to learn, and he shares his vast amount of trading knowledge every day in his Mastering Probability newsletter. Steve's award-winning newsletter, Mastering Probability, is delivered every trading day with updates throughout the afternoon. Sign up for Steve's market newsletter, Mastering Probability, and you'll receive access to seven of Steve's educational webinars absolutely free. At TFNN, all our newsletters come with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have absolutely nothing to worry about. Visit TFNN.com and try Mastering Probability 30 days risk-free today. TFNN, education investors. The reality is that navigating financial markets can be risky. Markets can be chaotic and difficult to understand. Having the latest market advice can help you turn this chaos into a key for creating winning trades. At TFNN, we understand that it can be hard to find reliable market news. That's why each of our market experts offers their very own market newsletter, a must-have tool for every trader out there striving to find an edge in today's markets. TFNN newsletters cover every aspect of the markets so you can analyze the market before you trade. Try any of our great newsletters risk-free with our 30-day money-back guarantee. Just visit the Newsletters tab on the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. Welcome back, folks. You got markets continuing to climb. S&P's up a full percentage point right now. And we got our man Teddy Kegstad on the line, folks. We talk to Teddy every Wednesday. And, Teddy, I appreciate you getting those technical difficulties worked out. And what we're going to do, we're going to extend the show, Teddy. We can't just cut it okay. to two minutes. It's too important of a day. If it's cool with you, sure. we'll go right through the top of the hour. And we'll just go till okay. three past, as we normally do. So give us a good nine, ten minutes, as usual, man. Um, sure. Because I appreciate you joining. It's an important day. So, so. Where do we kick things off, man, with uh, inflation, yields, the currencies? Where, what's on your mind to kick it off, Daddy? Well, it's Fed Day, so you know what? If it wasn't for the CPI number, which came out better than expected, um, which I think you have to really take it with a grain of salt. Um, yeah, it's a nice thing that CPI is going down in this 
and came out unexpected. However, it's not that big of a deal when you think like, look at it overall. And also, you're look, right now the media is focused on a snapshot of the last few months, being like, oh, inflation's going away, everything's working out, the Fed's going to start cutting rates soon, and what have you. That's not really the case if you look at things year over year, you know. And as far as the consumer price index, well, it's a lagging number. You know, we're starting to finally see the impact of where we were six months ago. You know, definitely three to six months ago. So what I want to tell you is that every over the past six months we've seen nothing but a rise in consumer prices okay so those numbers are going to hit us come august september right in front of the election so all this bandwagoning right now and i guarantee you the media is going to be sucking this up because they're going to expect that unemployment claims are going to come out higher tomorrow and if they do that's going to follow through on the little narrative that unemployment's going higher the fed likes that they want to see people out of work and they want to see that the cpi numbers and ppi numbers are starting to show that what they've done is helped um, I think once again they're lagging the market's ahead of itself right now it's what it normally does and all we are is bouncing we, we set we bounced off the bottom of a range or the upper band of a range that we've been in for most markets right now so we're having an exacerbated move because think about it it's Fed day nobody's doing anything so that means that the order book probably just got ran through off the numbers so I think the rally you're getting it's not because the number is so surprising it's really just because of the market environment today I appreciate the take. It is interesting looking at the market. Even, you know, the 10-year, of course, we have yields pulling back, as you mentioned, um, on the CPI number. But all we did was move back to pretty much right where we were coming into the hot jobs number. So it's interesting how the narrative can shift over the course of two to three days, right? It's like we come into the Correct. jobs number. Oh, my goodness, more jobs than I think it was something like Bloomberg had. Um they got 72 economists they poll. Nobody had a number of 272,000, man. Everybody was on the downside. How do you do that? Not even one person is, is like mm -hmm. a little bit to the upside of a little bit of risk. And then by Wednesday, we take it all back. And we got a 10-year yield right now of 4.3%. And I say to myself, and I agree with a lot of what you're saying, okay, so I look at things as a risk-reward parameter as a trader. And I say, okay, the market's pricing in the cuts – that we need more data for so where's your risk well the risk is that maybe we don't get that data right that that somehow right. if it's pricing in because there's there's no way we're getting more than one to two cuts this year how would that happen right. well the economy would just have to go to absolute dire i mean falling i don't think that's going to happen thankfully so mm -hmm. then where's the risk well we need a lot more data to line up to where the market is, which I find so interesting, because the 10-year yield at 4.3, that's quite a low number when you look at where we are, mm -hmm. when you look at the dot plots, all that stuff, so I found it interesting. But even on the 10-year on the chart, I pull it up just right back to where we were on Friday, and it only takes two or three days for the narrative just to shift completely, which I found right. remarkable in the I same way. I agree way. with you 100%. And once again, we're in a tight range. Like If you look at the currencies, the yen – it's not reacting Ooh, very much yeah. at all. It's been it's been in the sideways trade. You know, yeah. crude is rail crude is railing big time. So you're gonna tell me that if crude stays where it's at or even starts to go higher over the rest of the summer that come August, people are gonna believe that core inflation is going down when everything is costing them much more money. I mean, come on. Yeah. You know, you're not going to fool the people that much with that. You know. So and you got to look yeah. at the currencies like that too. Like when when the yen and the Swiss are really tight in their range off of this kind of a number. That's why I said this is an exacerbated move because it's Fed Day. What markets are, are the computers looking at? They're looking at the interest rates. They're not really looking at the currency so much, you know, except for maybe the yeah. big ones like the euro and the pound, which have moved. The New Zealand and the Australian, they've, they've been stretching their legs right now on those moves, you know. But I, like I said, I'd be careful with the follow through because what's going to support it, you know? And there's such a reaction off of nothing once again, what's going to support that follow through, you know? Hey, some of the – and I didn't follow too closely, but I saw they had elections over in Europe, right? And there was some movement over there. You have France calling an election. Does mm -hmm. that play into how you're looking at the euro at all? And I, I, you know, I really didn't dig too deeply into it, but I was seeing headlines everywhere Sunday night. One of my best friends lives in Switzerland himself, so he was talking about some mm -hmm. of those elections in Europe. Um, did any of that throw any flux into what you're looking for, whether it's a euro or, or kind of the action over there? I think it's it's the it's the beginning of something that if the if the mo if that movement can continue, 
it's very strong for the euro and also the EU gotcha. economy because right now the EU economy is collapsing. The Green New Deal is yeah. crushing them. You know, energy yeah. prices are soaring because they're so dependent and they won't do what they need to do. You know, yeah. so I mean, the, the German industrial complex now is running at like you know sixty percent, maybe at best of what they were just a year ago. You know, yeah. and let alone two years ago when we were in a pandemic, if you will. So I mean, if sure. you look at that, their output capacity is decreasing. There's complete social Social unrest, and they're they're, they're out of money. They have, and you have no money when you have a shrinking economy. How are you going to issue debt? You know, I yeah. mean, so yeah. that's the other thing too. They can cut rates all they want, you know, to inflate prices, but you're not going to have any liquidity, you know. And then you're looking at a really horrible spread developing between your short and long term rates if they start to pull that kind of game. But I do think politically, nice. if it gains fire and they can get more of these people with common sense back into the government, especially the EU, besides Germany, then you might start to see a balancing out of things in Europe and actually see their economy start to stabilize, which would be strong for especially the euro and even the Swiss. Because right now, the Swiss is the only currency that's strong there. The euro has been holding it. It's been in a range trade, you know, and it's only because our dollar is pretty much in a range trade as well, you know. Yes. So and, and I think that politically, you know, if this was to swing back the way it was, you know, then that would be really detrimental to the euro. Um, but this is something that could if this continues over the next six months to a year and let me tell you something political pressures on and they're different to their politicians over there like when they there are people are very quiet but once they start getting raising their arms and their voices um the politicians are running scared because they come right to their front door literally <laughs> they're right on their front door you know so i mean and that that changes things when all of a sudden you know your security doesn't matter and you have you know ten thousand people in front of your mansion you know so sure. i mean We'll see what happens. Hey, how about you talked about crude? So quite a pop just in the last you know few mm -hmm. days, but we're we're still under eighty dollars. I'm not sure if you heard me talking about pretty interesting the IEA coming out saying we might reach peak oil demand by 2030. Meanwhile, production continuing to rise over that time, and they put out a number, man, that we might. And I'm going long term, man. It doesn't matter for this trading, but it is interesting when you just look at you know our own production in the U.S. right versus the mm -hmm. Middle East production continuing to rise. Thankfully, we produce a lot of oil ourselves now, not as reliant on the Middle East. But um, they were talking about maybe you know by 2030 we might have a surplus on a global scale of eight million barrels a day. And I just found myself saying, geez, you know maybe that's part of the reason that on a longer term basis. You might face some heat about going to the upside because, boy, you know, you got a lot of unrest in the world. All right, we are wrapping up. What do you think of crude at 79 bucks? I, I, I like it. I like the bounce that we had over the past week. You know, just like I was saying a couple weeks ago, I think we found good support, and we're right back into that nice. little range. Nice. Teddy, I appreciate the time as always, man. We'll look forward to talking to you next Thanks, week. Tommy. Folks, check out the Tiger Forex Report at TFNN. Thanks, Teddy. Stay tuned for Basley's up next. The Have a great day, everybody. you're looking for is closer than you think. One or two adjustments are usually all you need to change